as chairman of this committee and, and with Senator Shelby, uh, a true gentleman. And I also want to thank Dick Durbin for his longtime leadership on this committee, uh, something that I have appreciated as a member and something that I have continued appreciation as his role as whip in, in the chairman and so in, the, in the caucus. And so thank you, uh, Senator Durbin. Uh, today we have Ms. McQuiston and, and Dr. Thompson virtually. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and I want to thank you for your ongoing hard work to lead and shape the Department of Defense Innovation and Modernization efforts. Uh, when it comes to federal funding priorities, few things are more important than innovation and research. And it is critical for Congress to continue to make strong research investments across the board. America is facing many difficult and evolving national security challenges right now. We have heard from combat commands in recent weeks about the daily threats they face, particularly from Admiral Davidson, the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command. In this subcommittee, it is critical that we do our best to ensure our service members continue to have access to the world's most sophisticated and advanced technologies. So I hope to hear the witnesses' perspective on the global race for innovation, and particularly as we compete with China and Russia. And I look forward to learning more about ongoing and future DOD technology innovation efforts and whether it has the tools and resources it needs to work with various partners across the country. And that includes taking advantage of the incredible innovations happening across this country, including those at small businesses who can often bring fresh ideas, nimble operations, and cutting edge in, in inventions to the table. With that, I will turn it to Ranking Member Shelby for his comments. Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for this hearing. I think it's very important to uh, have a hearing with DARPA. Um, welcome. This committee has approved billions of dollars, Mr. Chairman, for basic research, applied uh, research, and advanced technology development to support efforts that would allow our military to maintain a competitive advantage and strategic advantage over our adversaries. Our technological and industrial progress remains a constant target from China and Russia and other nation states that are actively working to undermine and surpass our military's advancements. I believe we need a ready and lethal force equipped with modernized systems capable of providing strong national security and importantly, deterring war. Our investments in innovative research are critical in guaranteeing success here. Over the last four years, this committee has supported the necessary budget increases in cutting edge research areas such as hypersonics, artificial intelligence, unmanned systems, and microelectronics to address warfighter needs and capability gaps. And with the top line budget recommendation unveiled by the current administration last week, I'm currently concerned about our ability to continue to make those essential strategic investments that will allow us to keep pace. I look forward to hearing from uh, the witnesses today about the progress being made in innovation and technology within the Department of Defense and how resource constraints may impact the department's ability to field cutting edge technology in the future. I also recognize that we're significant, significantly constrained from getting into many of the details here today uh, that would provide for a comprehensive discussion in an open hearing setting. Perhaps, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd suggest that we consider a classified discussion with DARPA at, at a later date when you can have it, because DAR what DARPA is doing is important to all of us, and especially to our armed forces. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, Senator Shelby, uh, and we will take we'll take that up. We'll make that happen. Um, uh, I would recognize uh, Ms. Ms. Quiston for a statement. Do you have uh, five minutes? There is a memorial service at 11, so I'd ask you to try to keep your comments to five minutes uh, and so we can get some questions. Uh, the rest of your statement, for sure, your full statement will be a part of the record. So you have the floor. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing this opportunity to testify. Need to turn your mic on, please. Apologize. Is it on now? Yeah, bring it closer to your mouth. My help. It's not lighting up. Okay. I apologize. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and members of the committee, thank you for providing this opportunity to testify before you today. It's an honor to be here alongside my friend and colleague, Dr. Stephanie Tompkins, Director of DARPA. 
I'm truly honored to represent the research and engineering workforce. I'm also excited to return to public service. I began my first government tour in 2006 at DARPA, and today I return to public service performing the duties of undersecretary, overseeing DARPA, as well as DIU, MDA, space development agencies, service labs, joint prototyping, and experimentation. RE serves as the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Defense, strengthening national security and boosting economic security. Investments in science, technology, and innovation today can pay dividends tomorrow. When I first started at DARPA, scientists were conducting research in vaccine technology. Today, those discoveries have contributed to the success of the COVID-19 vaccines. I'm quite excited and proud that we are all benefiting from past investments as we address the global pandemic. This is just one example of the tremendous impact DOD investments have, not just for our military, but for our nation as a whole. To continue this track record of success, we must reaffirm our commitment to science, technology, and innovation today to guarantee a strong tomorrow. This strategy for the future is critical because our competitors are moving quickly. The use of drones in the recent conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia may foreshadow things to come, as others move more quickly to adopt cheap emerging technology. As both Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks have stated, the People's Republic of China is the pacing challenge to the US military. Bringing new technology and innovations will be central to meeting that challenge. Presenting a credible deterrent to potential adversaries requires us to develop and field emerging technologies. We must innovate at speed and scale. Success requires more than a go-it-alone approach. We must explore more flexible partnerships with the private sector and academia, with small businesses and HBCUs. We must reinvigorate our federal research capabilities, elevate science, promote technology, and expand partnerships with our allies. r and &E is committed to overcoming the valley of death. We've shown that innovation and modernization can be done faster with more flexibility and commercial opportunities. From low cost expendable drones to safer ion batteries, we must strive to eliminate gaps in planning or funding that can leave a project sitting on the shelf for years. We must do more to engage the services from day one. Our competitors and potential adversaries will not wait for our planning and budget cycles. We must balance oversight with the need to move quickly in order to maintain our advantages. This last year has demonstrated the importance of supply chains. The President and Congress have made it clear that onshoring the supply chain for microelectronics is critical to our national and economic security. The Department has been taking actions to make microelectronics trustworthy, available, and sustainable. When I joined the government labs, um, our, our labs are the premier place to work. Although we employ some of the best and brightest minds, we are losing talent to the private sector and competitors. The hiring flexibility Congress has recently given to the department are helping, but we need to do more. One bright spot I want to highlight is DOD Vannevar Bush faculty member John Rogers, who pioneered the new field of bioelectronics. Rogers' research was the foundation of a new class of stretchable electronic devices. This research led to the 2020 release of a new flexible skin patch that can track a person's health through sweat. It allows for wearable devices to detect whether someone has COVID-19. His company is award-winning and moving to commercialize the sensors based on this research. While I'm optimistic about r and ability to be successful, we have significant work ahead. Having an undersecretary solely focused on innovation could not be more important than it is today. I look forward to partnering with Congress to advance our mission, to lead in technology dominance across the DOD, and ensure the unquestioned superiority of the joint force while strengthening the American economy. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Ms. McChristen, thank you for your testimony, and there will be questions. Uh, well, now we'll now go to Dr. Thompson for her statement. Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Shelby, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to, te opportunity to testify today and for your strong support of DARPA over the years. My name is Stephanie Tompkins, and I serve as the director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. It's a real pleasure to be here with my friend and colleague, Ms. Barbara McQuiston, from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. While we are part of and work closely with Ms. McQuiston's organization, DARPA has a unique mission in both the DOD community and the broader U.S. technology ecosystem. That mission is to prevent strategic surprise by making pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. What that means is we anticipate, create, and demonstrate technologies that are nowhere on technology roadmaps and often outside most people's imaginations. For over 60 years now, in partnership with innovators inside and outside government, 
DARPA has repeatedly delivered on our mission. We've transformed revolutionary concepts and seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Examples of those capabilities include stealth technology, precision guided weapons, unmanned aerial vehicles, as well as many icons of modern society, such as the internet, automated voice recognition and language translation, and GPS receivers small enough to embed in nearly any consumer device. Technologies like these provide more options for our nation's leaders and the military services. And today, with increasingly complex challenges in a rapidly changing world, DARPA's role has never been more vital. At DARPA, we think not just about scientific and engineering innovation though, but also about the innovation ecosystem. That ecosystem includes many overlapping and adjacent communities from academia, industry, and government. It includes, it includes everything from fundamental research to global scale systems of systems. It includes innovation, not only in technology, but in processes and transition strategies as well. And most importantly, it includes a rotating cast of DARPA program managers who come from and will return to that ecosystem and who seek to solve not just today's problems, but tomorrow's as well. One of the best illustrations of how DARPA works is related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So about five years ago, when I was serving in a different role at DARPA, I spent a lot of time on the road trying to expand and diversify our performer base. One of the programs I talked about the most involved heavy investment into something called mRNA vaccines. So mRNA vaccines are pretty much a household word today, but at the time they were much, much more obscure. And DARPA's investments were based on the insight of individual program managers who anticipated their need for both military and public health missions. The research that DARPA first initiated more than a decade ago is now playing a leading and catalytic role in today's fight against COVID-19. In typical DARPA fashion, we made significant investments in a technology years before it was known to be needed, leading to high impact capabilities related to prevention, diagnostics, and treatment that have helped to mitigate the current crisis. From vaccines and diagnostics to defensive and offensive hypersonic technologies, state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, quantum systems, microelectronic solutions, and much, much more, DARPA has forged new paths and continues to deliver on our mission. I look forward to working with the members of the subcommittee and others in Congress to ensure the security and resilience of our nation. And I would be most pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for your testimony. Um, because Senator Durbin has a commitment for the memorial service, I'm gonna recognize him first. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses who have joined us today. I guess uh, my opening question is not going to be specific to any area of innovation, but just very generic. If you ask the Department of Defense in previous administrations, and I'll bet in this one as well, who are our, our hard targets? Who are our major adversaries in the world? They would usually uh, report four pretty obvious ones, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. And then if you'd ask a follow-up question, how much do each of these major uh, adversaries spend in their annual budget for their military? you would find numbers that range from uh, very small to uh, still very modest in comparison to the United States. And the reason I raise this question regularly is we spend more than all of the other nations in the world on defense and security, uh, and we certainly want to be safe as a nation. But it's our job here in this committee to ask a question, are we getting our money's worth? out of this. And when it comes to innovation, I noticed uh, Ms. McQuiston uh, in your st statement as well as uh, the statement by Dr. Tompkins, there was reference to competition with adversaries. You would think when you consider the hundreds of billions of dollars that we spend each year that that would hardly ever be the case. It's like a high school team regularly beating the New York Yankees. You just don't expect that to happen when you compare the resources that are being dedicated. Can you put innovation in that context and ask whether or not our investment in innovation gives us a natural lead, a, an acquired lead uh, in this competition that uh, the budget figures belie? I will, I will take that answer. Um, we're very lucky. We just started the innovation steering group under uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks. And what we're doing in innovation is looking across the DOD as transform transforming a lot of the processes in order to be better adapters of technology and to 
more efficiently and rapidly modernized. Our services have the burden sometimes of having the legacy city systems and the newer technologies and disruptive technologies coming on board. We're mo moving modernization ahead, but we, need, we can always do it better and, and more innovatively. We have, when I think of innovation, I think of two things, efficiency and effectiveness. So efficiency is doing things right, and effectiveness is doing the right thing. So with the range of new technologies that can be adopted at a greater speed for us, I believe that we can come up to par and actually exceed so, the market and our competitors. So I've read some histories of DARPA, Pentagon's brain, and uh, books like that. Very impressive. And I noticed that time and again, there was disruptive thinking and planning, and some of it fell flat on its face, but that's to be expected. So I guess my question is, as we fund things already discovered in mass, with massive amounts of taxpayers' dollars, uh, how, how do you combat the fighting the last war syndrome uh, and establishment syndrome that says we've got to keep doing more of what we've done before? Uh, and how do you get into asymmetrical thinking in an establishment as large as the Department of Defense? The Disruptive Innovation Unit that we have under Research and Engineering has that mission uh, entirely because they're working with the National Security Innovation Network, the National Security Capital, and bringing in market innovations and commercialized technologies. With uh, the activities to date, they have 189 companies now on contract, 75% are small business, 32% are first-time vendors, and 10% have already transitioned into military use. And that's the key, to be flexible and, and to work at speed, at commercial speed, in order to integrate the technology rapidly into the service. At the same time, we need to understand what the disruptive technology can mean for our advantage and also for the needs within the military. So wargaming and putting together exercises and demonstration to show what, what could be capable, capable. As DARPA can show you, a lot of times we put the needs and the requirements forward but oftentimes the newer technology is a capability that no one even conceived would have been possible. So it's the merging of the future with the needs of today that actually will keep technology in the leading edge and keep us competitive with uh, the national security and the economic security of our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing. I think it's very important. Um, I, as I said earlier, I don't know what we can get into. It's sensitive in this open hearing today, but the chairman has indicated that uh, we will have a closed hearing and hope to get you back and so forth. In the area of quantum and artificial intelligence, China and Russia, you know, we all know, are advancing their military technologies always and increasing their defense budgets at alarming rates. How is the department continuing to reform its processes and investment decisions to ensure that the U.S. will maintain the technical dominance necessary to deter our adversaries? And what can you speak to in this area? I don't know. Well, there's a, there's a few things I can speak to you. Uh, we've, we have been looking at quantum from the scientific side probably at least 20 years or more, um, but we've had success. Touch on how important quantum computing is if we can ever work it all out. And it's also important to our adversaries, is it not? Yes, actually the, f the future of network, network technology and security uh, will greatly rely on quantum technology. And uh, DARPA, I know, has had initiatives in this area. I'm happy to say that a lot of them are starting to see commercialization as well. So I think our investment in that area is starting to pay off. So um, I think you will actually see more activity on there. Some of the technologies we can brief you in another venue. What trade-offs in the area of hypersonics are we having to make as it relates to weapon development and fielding, uh, which would come with it, uh, due to resource constraints? Do, are you getting what you need at DARPA for this sensitive, very important research. Yes, sir. In, um, to the extent that I can 
Go ahead. Uh, discuss this in this hearing. Um, the support that we have for our hypersonics programs, both offensive and, and defensive, um, is adequate, and we can and we can go into more details on trade-offs in a different venue. Okay. In the area of space development, uh, two years ago, the Space Development Agency was created to accelerate the development and fielding of the next generation space capabilities. Where are we there today, and where are our adversaries? Well, I'm happy to say for what the Space Development Agency has put together is rapidly developing new space architectures and, at, and commercial development processes in alignment with uh, capabilities and speed. We're integrating ground stations for advanced data links at Fort Greeley, Alaska. We're working with uh, putting forward constructive disruptors for operations at LEO. Uh, the first satellite demonstrations for communication are scheduled for FY22. And working on at what I would call commercial speeds, uh, commercial launch speeds, and setting, putting, setting up satellite operations at Grand, Grand Forks and at Redstone Arsenal. I, I really do believe that, that speed and adaptation of spiral development and what we already see in commercial launch processes is where we need to step up uh, in, in timing for being able to put our capability up in space. So I, again, if we want to talk specifics on, on where we are tactically, I, another venue, we would be happy to, to go into that. Thank you. Dr. Tompkins, uh, in the area of cyber technology, uh, how important is quantum computing and the hopefully a good res research coming out of there? What will that do for us or hopefully do for us in the area so of cyber? In cyber, in cyber technology, um, quantum computing offers a, bunch, uh, a few different opportunity spaces. One obviously is in the area of quantum encryption, which I think has been most broadly discussed. Um, the other, I think, is in the area of quantum computing and simulation, which then allows us um, to solve different kinds of optimization and sort of com um, complexity type problems, which would allow us to focus on um, analyzing, understanding, modeling, um, and predicting a much wider range of potential um, cyber behaviors and activities, and then similarly defending against them. Dr. Com Tompkins, one more question, if I could. In the area of hypersonics, uh, we all know that we've got a challenge there as far as developing the hypersonic offensive weapon and also defending against it. Uh, where are we today and how, what kind of time frame do you think we have before we can really field what we need for the security of the country? So DARPA has um, two initiatives in the defensive um, hypersonics arena. Um, details of both, um, obviously, as you have mentioned, are going to have to go into a different session. Um, there is one um, very specifically, um, the program Glidebreaker, in which we're work working closely with NDA um, to um, de-risk um, certain key aspects of the overall technology space. The timing of exactly when the transition of those technologies would go into a broader end-to-end -end system, I think is a broader, is both a, a conversation that goes beyond just DARPA, but also does require um, the ability to talk in a closed setting. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. Yeah, thank you, Senator Shelby. Uh, Ms. McQuiston, um, I, I want to touch on um, a couple things. I want to touch on, number one, our competitiveness compared to where we were five or ten years ago. And, and how, how, you assess, uh, how you assess our success. Uh, I know you talked about war gaming, but I, I want to get into that a little more. But let, let's, let's start with uh, our competitiveness compared to where we were. Are we ahead, behind? I think the United States is one of the best innovators of technology overall. I think that we have the, some of the brightest people, the determination, the freedom, the flexible financial systems, and the determination to really succeed. To match that with the Department of Defense, we need to have the same innovative culture as we have in our commercial industry. That's why uh, adoption of commercial technology at the speed of which uh, activities occur in the commercial world will be critical to more rapidly be able to gain 
the capabilities that the new technology and modernization will give to the military. We are in a good position, but we can always be in a much better one. So uh, is it fair to say by what you've just said that um, we are more competitive today than we were five or 10 years ago? I, would, I believe we are, and I believe okay. it's because we are modernizing. Okay, and then how do, how do you assess that competitiveness? How do you assess, um, you know, defining where we're at? Well, I, you know, in, a, in, a, in an open session along this line, I would, I would actually point to the vaccine technology. These, we, we've been thinking a lot about new frontiers, about challenges that the world is facing right now. And uh, we've been thinking about them and doing things for a while. And so surprises never come, disruptive technology never comes out of the blue. DARPA has been our, our great uh, uh, jewel in being able to anticipate these things and start the technology ecosystem in new, in new capabilities that have really been transformational for, for the United States. Okay. okay. So uh, one more, and that is uh, innovative technologies cover a, a wide range. Mm -hmm. uh, how, are we prioritizing, how are we prioritizing those investments? And, and could you give me a preview of the administration's priorities? They may be the same answer for both questions. The Office at Research and Engineering, the Office of Modernization, uh, currently has 11 priorities. Uh, they fold into uh, a lot of what uh, is going on relative to being able to add capabilities, such as in AI, hypersonics, um, other areas of the 11 modernization techniques. Some of them will be more mature and able to have rapid adaptation. Other technologies will need more time. Uh, based on its development. That said, I do believe we can move faster to adopt those technologies. With regards to where they stand with the administration as Secretary of Defense and the prioritizations, I would defer to, to the agency overall. Okay. Uh, Dr. Com Tompkins, uh, DARPA invented uh, the internet for the Department of Defense. It was adapted, uh, adopted worldwide. Um, you talked about the uh, uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, are you working on any other technologies that have broader appeal beyond the Department of Defense? Dr. Thompson? Certainly. Um, one example would be work that we're doing in um, 5G technologies for communications. So, um, you know, 5G is one of those areas which suffers a little bit from siloed, proprietary, um, sort of vendor-driven um, capabilities. And so DARPA has a program called Open programmable and secure 5G, which intends, which basically seeks to create an open source um, 5G capability, which would open up um, both from military perspectives and also ultimately from commercial economic perspectives, um, the power of, of 5G for a whole range of sort of dual use capabilities. All right, I'm gonna go to uh, Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, thank both of our witnesses for joining us. Let me uh, begin by asking a question of Dr. Tompkins uh, about cybersecurity. Um, this has been a priority of mine, and we have lots of reasons for that to be the case. It's important. But could you describe for me the, how mosaics and other related cyber initiatives will not only support the de department's cyber defense, but the industrial partners that are critical to our nation's security? Certainly. So DARPA has um, a, a fairly large number of different programs focusing on cybersecurity um, with priorities in the areas of uh, prevention. Um, so things like network operations analytics, um, and as well as looking at topics in the area of um, attack attribution and graceful degradation and recovery, because we do understand that um, as strong as we are in defense, we also have to be prepared for the attack that does get through. In um, those cases, they are looking not only at military systems, but they translate very naturally to corporate systems. They translate to um, infrastructure systems such as you know, the power grid, um, water supply security, um, and many others. Are those programs receiving the support they need to deploy new capabilities to, from the lab to the force? Yes, sir, I do believe they, they are. 
um, when one of the really nice things about cyber technologies, um, especially if they are mainly focused on software, is that they transition much more naturally and much more quickly than a lot of hardware focused technologies. So um, some of these, again, are things we would have to discuss in a different venue, but we have um, excellent collaboration, particularly with organizations like Cyber Command, where we often go in to demonstrate an experimental capability and can very quickly turn it into something that transitions to their operational use in the course of a program. Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McQuiston, uh, let me follow up with what Senator Shelby was conversing with you about uh, hypersonics. Uh, can you please provide an update on the industrial base partnerships that DOD has entered into to support carbon-carbon manufacturing initiatives? Additive manufacturing for hy hypersonics has been key. In fact, it's uh, been a real enabler in commercial technologies as well. Um, it's not only sort of the breakthrough technology for hypersonics, but it's also being used in the automotive industry to really dramatically change fuel efficiency. Um, I personally have not had the time to go through other agreements that we may have within the industry, but I would welcome that opportunity to look to come back to you with the details on this. I'd welcome further conversations with you. Uh, as our hypersonic batteries come online and we begin to manufacture hypersonic missiles to scale, do we have the industrial base capacity to manufacture at scale? I, I, be I believe we do. I believe that we are up for the challenge and can meet it. So what are the, what are the uh, challenges that you, we have in, in ramping up our production? Well, right now we have a roadmap as to where we're moving it for fielding and production use. Uh, it is moving ahead, and uh, I'm unaware of any specific challenge that we might have right now. Uh, I'd uh, appreciate uh, additional conversations with you. Maybe we can have a, a, a meeting or a... I think in another venue, we could actually get into more detail exactly. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, ask a final question of this one about space. Uh, I now co-chair the Senate Space Force Caucus with uh, the ranking me and I'm the ranking member of the CJS, the NASA Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, along with Senator Shaheen. Uh, how is your office working with commercial and government partners to make certain that satellite constellations remain secure uh, from cyber and kinetic attacks? Um, that's very important to us uh, in looking at that. In fact, we, recently we had used adopted commercial processes, which uh, often in the past financial in institutes would use, to uh, basically open up a, a satellite opportunity to hack a sack, we called it. Um, so you could have hackers try to break in and disrupt uh, uh, operations options of the satellite. This has actually been a very good learning platform uh, and to strengthen our own security within our satellite systems. So again, adopting both commercial and, uh, and putting together new technologies for defensive security operations within LEO and on our satellite operations is going to be a very high priority for the Department of Defense. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our military is reliant on lithium ion batteries to power critical systems, including planned energy in intensive applications like advanced radars and sensors. Unfortunately, we are also reliant on foreign companies, including in China, for components that go into these batteries. We have really struggled to stand up domestic R&D capability to discover and validate new battery chemistries and technologies that would improve performance and safety and reduce costs for both military and commercial applications. And currently, most of that innovation and resulting intellectual property is happening in Asia. On this latter point, I believe the US needs to build a robust independent commercial cell development and testing capability to support advanced battery technologies needed for military systems and commercial applications like electric vehicles and electric grid storage. Uh, Ms. McQuiston, I would like to hear your thoughts on how DOD can make investments to address these challenges and support next generation battery technology. Safe uses of lithium batteries actually has been a priority for the science uh, and the university uh, work that we've been doing. That said, battery technology has quite a range within the military from the amount of batteries that need to be in the field 
to moving forward with um, high power, high power uh, uh, weapon systems. I would say that battery technology is going to be key for microgrids uh, that we would need uh, at basing and uh, forward sites. I think batteries are a priority. The science and the materials uh, can actually move forward, I think, if we uh, focus our energies. DARPA is always good at looking at materials, and batteries have always been uh, a capability of, that they've had at modernizing and perhaps inventing new, new technologies and safer approaches at higher density, energy density. Thank you. Um, I've been advocating for strengthening our Buy America policies, including extending domestic content requirements down the supply chain to support the U.S. industrial base. Those efforts are critical, but more focused on the acquisition side of DOD investment policy. I also believe that we need to do more on the research development and innovation side. Those areas, Ms. McQuiston, over which you have responsibility. If we look at placing, at, at pacing, uh, the pacing threat of China, let's say in the shipbuilding sector, DOD has reported that it has become the top ship producing nation in the world and produces most of its critical components like engines, weapons, and electronic systems. The Chinese government is investing massive sums to ensure that those components are high performing and manufacturable at scale. I believe that the DOD using existing authorities should provide funding to our domestic shipbuilding industrial base, particularly small and medium sized businesses to increase their technical capability, grow their capacity and improve their manufacturing technology, design and engineering processes. Across the DOD research and engineering enterprise, what are your priorities for supporting the industrial base and what programs and investments will you make to support the technological competitiveness and manufacturing capacity of our critical defense suppliers? Manufacturing is key uh, to a number of technologies across the board. And being able to modernize and work with manufacturing and make investments is also key to our economic security. Um, when you look at uh, manufacturing, it's not only for perhaps DOD enabling uh, capability and scale, but it's also to de-risk some of the newer technologies that were, are required. And we have a number of manufacturing programs in this, play, in this area um, that we're moving forward. Uh, but it, we are uh, working at, with uh, aspects of this from 5G and the hyper, in the microelectronic side straight through to materials battery technology, as we just discussed, and um, moving into uh, uh, a program that we have at a uh, university that's working in materials that would be supported for difficult marine environments. So uh, I concur with you on the need for manufacturing. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to Ms. McQuiston and Dr. Tomskin, thank you, Tompkins. Thank you both very much for your work and for testifying today. I, I appreciate the importance of DARPA and of our invest, investing public dollars in innovation and research for our national security. But you alluded to this, I think, earlier, Ms. McQuiston, when you talked about the private sector. And the fact is, much of the innovation that we benefit from comes from the private sector. Is that correct? I would say that it's quite an engine for us in innovation, absolutely. And one of the programs that has been really successful in promoting small businesses to do that kind of research is the SBIR program. Can you speak to how important you think that is? I think it's very important. Um, you know, SBIRs and STTRs have been uh, quite an engine for us economically. And moving, uh, moving uh, uh, investments forward in this area can have a great uh, net gain in the economy as well. 
Small businesses from the investment side are a 22 to 1 return on the DOD investment. So I, anything we can do to, to encourage and bridge the gap, so to speak, between defense needs and small business capabilities will be critical. We have a protege program going forward with large companies so that the smaller companies can sort of be able to contribute in a way that's, that's more meaningful to the DOD mission. We are also looking through DIU to bring on more small businesses and non-traditional performers to bring capability to uh, the warfighters' mission. So I think that's a huge focus. We have to be able to, to, to work at the speed of commercial flexibility because we don't want to just be able to understand what their technology is. We need to be able to capitalize on it and field these systems for the warfighter. So that's going to mean that we have to move at speeds that are within a commercial time frame. So that's going to be critical in not only encouraging small business, but actually um, being able to retain fielded systems and the support of growing our economy with small businesses. Well, thank you very much. We extended the SBIR program or reauthorized it for five years back in 2017, mm -hmm. but that means it's going to expire again in 2022. So, Mr. Chairman, I would just um, say, based on what we've heard and what we know is significant about the SBIR program, we should start from now to extend, reauthorize that, and I would argue we should reauthorize it permanently. So, thank you. Can you speak to what happens when we develop innovative technologies um, that are then adopted by our adversaries and used to undermine um, the United States. What, how do we prevent that? What, what can we do to better make sure that what we're doing in innovation doesn't get pirated by our adversaries? Well, I think securing our, our our technology is key. We have the TAPS program, which uh, is working to make sure that our research and development dollars are, are secure, looking at university funding and having transparency in an area of research that we're, we're, we think is critical so that we understand other areas of funding that are coming in. We also want to carefully work with scientists and um, and researchers who we do not feel that there's an individual that could be, a, could be a risk to the performance there. But I do believe we need to be smart and strategic about what we need to protect and keep the pace of surprise moving forward. That's the great thing about DARPA, because there's always a new frontier. And there'll always be you know, people adopting and, and catching up. But if we're always moving ahead, we make the process of catching up that much more difficult. Though security, I think, especially at the rate of cybersecurity and, um, and really pr protecting our own investments is got to be in the forefront as we move forward, but to do it smartly. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I only have a few seconds left, but I did want to ask you, because you were talking about the challenge of... Um, <laughs> legacy systems and innovation and how to balance um, phasing one out or addressing new innovative um, technology. When, when we do that, is it usual that contracts are awarded when we've got a technology that has not been proven or tested or fielded in any way? Can you answer that? Um. I, off the top of my head, I would say that we definitely need to make sure that we have trust in the system before it's fielded, which is why we've stood up three offices between the systems engineering office at SCO, DIU with the experimentation and fielding, and, uh, and then emergent technology capability and working with that to demonstrate its capability. But in some technologies, it can move quite rapidly. So if we're looking at evolving technologies, such as in cybersecurity, we, have, we should have a rapid pace at being able to develop, test, and field, uh, field this capability rather quickly. Obviously, other technologies would take more time in testing, but we have to be flexible in how we approach the technology, which goes back to innovation. And it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. You have to be doing the right thing but you, and doing it correctly, but you have to adopt the flexibility 
in the program to account for the type of technology you're managing with the goal of fielding it as rapidly as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, visit with you today, uh, Secretary McQuiston. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, SDA, the uh, Space Defense Agency, working with Grand Force Air Force Base. We appreciate that very much. As you know, we've worked very diligently to develop all things unmanned aviation there. And obviously, that whole link and the development with the satellites is incredibly important. We think we have an absolutely unique resource there. So we appreciate it. And we appreciate um, the working relationship we have with the Space Development Agency. Uh, we think that um, SDA needs to continue to accelerate the development of technology for the warfighter. I think that's incredibly important. So tell me, how will you ensure that SDA can provide innovative and independent support to our warfighters, uh, even as you transition to Space Force in October of 2022? And obviously we're very concerned about supporting that effort because we think it's very worthwhile, but also because we think it's important that Grand Forks, uh, Air Force Base is part of that. Yes, I believe keeping in place the uh, spiral development process that they put in to work at commercial speeds and to very quickly be able to field capability will be the best way to uh, work with this uh, development of technology for space. I think it's a already a proven pace that you see with commercial entities. And I believe that uh, what we have uh, started right now uh, with the Space Development Agency will prove itself by their two-year cycle time for being able to update capabilities that we're bringing to the warfighter. Good, and we appreciate very much the working relationship that we've had with you. Is there anything that we can do at this time that you think is particularly helpful to make sure that we continue to advance this initiative? Well, we appreciate your support for this effort, and uh, that that is invaluable in itself. So thank you. And same questions for uh, Dr. Topkins. Did you have anything that you would add? Um, I, I agree with Ms. McQuiston um, regarding the support and appreciation for um, all the support that you provided. And in um, DARPA works very closely with the SDA, specifically in developing new technologies, which then de-risk you know, elements of the technology for them to deploy. And we look forward to seeing um, the, uh, fruish, the fruition of some of those efforts in the near future. Good, and again, we wanna make sure that we continue to offer any and all assistance so that that development continues as it is. We think it's incredibly important. And, and uh, back to you, Secretary McQuiston. Uh, now talk to me in terms of the next step, which is not just that communication uh, with the lower orbit satellites, but then also the communication between uh, satellites and unmanned uh, aviation. And again, that's one of the things that we've developed in a way like no other. And obviously that's gonna be an incredibly important part of this whole effort. So talk to me about uh, development on that second step as well. Yeah, uh, looking at being able to have the battle space information backbone in place. We have JADC2 as a program and we also have AB2 moving forward and looking at the information moving within the network and able to be used between ground and space will be critical. So the network and the data availability will actually be quite a platform for innovation and being able to constantly grow our capabilities at a rapid speed for the warfighter. Yeah, and tell me a little bit more about that interagency cooperation, because one of the things we've done is we've broken down barriers. I mean, we're working with everybody. It's not just at the state and local level, but all the different agencies, including NASA, Department of Defense, FAA, and everybody else. How are you working to make sure that you're integrating all the uh, uh, agencies in there? as well in this effort? We are working with all the agencies and I believe the relationships are very good because everybody it wants to move forward in this area. So um, I would say right now, we keep the pace moving forward. Great, thank you so much. And, and Dr. Tompkins, anything else that you might wanna add on that issue? Um, I, I completely agree with uh, everything Ms. McQuiston has said. I think in the interest of time, we'll leave it there just with our, our thanks and our excitement about the future.
Okay, then I just want to thank both of you for your innovation and your creativity and your strong leadership. We truly appreciate the working relationship. Thanks so much, and we'll continue to support your efforts in this very important area. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoven. Uh, just one more question for me, and then we'll close out. Uh, this is for both both of the testifiers, um, and it's been talked about with previous questions. I think it's important that we add value by tapping into academia and private sector, small business and large business. Um, from your guys' perspective, has there been greater participation uh, by folks outside your agencies over the last years has been pretty static or less? I think there's been larger participation and mostly because of the outreach programs that we've put together, especially through the Defense Innovation Unit, because we're seeing a lot of non-traditional companies coming in and we're seeing the increase of small business that are excited to work with the Defense Department and able to demonstrate their capabilities, but more is, more is required. Okay, Dr. Tompkins? Yes, yeah, similarly, um, of course, you know, DARPA's funding goes entirely to those external partners. Um, so the, what, we, what we would be tracking is sort of the diversification of that performer space. And um, what we look for are organizations that have never worked with DARPA before, have never worked with the DOD. And through those kinds of outreach activities um, that Ms. McQuiston just mentioned, we are seeing that increase and we hope to see it even more um, to get the best ideas um, and to get the best capabilities, we need to be reaching the broadest possible and most diverse uh, performer pool possible. Do either of you see any existing barriers to working with your particular agencies? Um, and if you do, are there bar are those barriers things that you can break down or do you need congressional help? Well, right now at R&E launching the Innovation Steering Group, I'm looking for areas of continual improvement and I think that we will be able to articulate sort of changes that need to take place internally in order to become more rapid in an adaptation of technology and to be more flexible in being able to do that. So no barriers? At, at this time, I would say it's a matter of rolling up our sleeves. Okay. Dr. Tompkins? Um, the one thing I would suggest is that um, uh, we're going to be taking a hard look at some of the the sort of potential barriers for organizations that don't traditionally work with the Department of Defense, looking at the cost of compliance and looking at sort of the, the murkiness um, of, of how organization, organizations can successfully comply. I think this is particularly um, tough on smaller businesses, commercial organizations that haven't worked with defense before, and many different um, classes of universities where the amount of overhead um, that they can afford to put in to being able to be sufficiently compliant can be really challenging. And so we will be looking for ways um, to sort of meet them in the middle and find ways to make it easier for them to participate while still being fully compliant with our requirements. Okay, thank you. Senator Shelby, you have anything you wanted? I have nothing else, but okay. I do look forward to uh, classified hearings with this group because I think it's very important. We will uh, make sure that our staffs work together and make that happen. Um, uh, I just want to appreciate, uh, express my appreciation for the testimony that was presented here today. Uh, senators need to know that they may submit additional written questions, and we would ask you to respond to them in a, in a reasonable uh, period of time. Uh, the Defense Subcommittee will reconvene on Tuesday, April 20th at 9.30 for a hearing on the Defense Health Program. With that, this subcommittee stands in recess. Thank you. Thank you.